Hello, everyone. I'm Maureen Greeley, your host for Kaleidoscope, where we celebrate diverse reflections and views on mental health equity. We're so excited to be here during National American Indian Heritage Month. And before we begin our program and bring in the wonderful guests we have, I'd like to take a moment as we think about cultural humility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, our Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling would like to offer this land acknowledgement today. This Kaleidoscope event is intended to reach audiences across the country and into other countries as well, where a rich diversity of indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and been stewards for thousands of years. In Washington state, where we work to provide services for prevention, awareness, treatment, and recovery support, for mental health issues, we are honored to work closely with many tribal nations. Please join us in support of efforts to affirm tribal sovereignty and in displaying respect and gratitude for all indigenous communities. I'm so excited to bring on our guests today. We have three wonderful folks from across the country, Drs. Belcourt, Bloom, and Harwell, so let's bring in Annie Belcourt, Otter Woman. She is an American Indian professor in the College of Health at the University of Montana's Pharmacy Practice and School of Public and Community Health Sciences Departments. She is an enrolled tribal member of the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, Hidatsa, Blackfeet, and Chippewa descent. Her studies and clinical priorities include work in mental health disparities, post-traumatic stress, disorder, risk, resiliency, and environmental public health within the cultural context of American Indian communities. Thank you so much for being with us today, Annie. In addition, we have Dr. Art Bloom, who is professor of clinical psychology at Washington State University. He's been honored with the Trimble and Horvat Award for distinguished contributions to native and indigenous psychology and has served as president of the American Psychological Association Society of Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race, and of the Society of Indian Psychologists, and is currently serving on the American Psychological Association's Presidential Task Force on Psychology and Health Equity. And he's got some fun, exciting news to share with us today that is breaking news. And last but not least, we have our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Wiley Harwell from Oklahoma. Wiley is the executive director of the Oklahoma Association for Problem and Compulsive Gambling. He is a licensed professional counselor, a certified employee assistance professional, and is a national certified gambling counselor. So, so thrilled to have all of you with us here today. I want to start by talking a little bit about the history, heritage, and culture of indigenous peoples because it covers thousands of years and vast expanses across every part of the Americas. To speak of American Indians as though they are one collective people doesn't do honor to the rich diversity of the cultures and traditions and lifestyles and languages and so much more. So when we think about Native American sovereign tribal nations, and I hope you can help people understand what that means, we're talking hundreds of sovereign tribal nations and Native Indigenous people in America. And when we talk about culture, just language alone, more than 200 rich, amazing languages that are represented among these peoples. So let's start and talk a little bit about how indigenous peoples use their culture as part of the way to celebrate in tradition, in ceremony and ritual, but also how that helps with mental health issues and health in general, in terms of a supportive family community unit. So whoever would like to jump in here. Well, I will start. Uh, Oklahoma has, is the home of 39 indigenous tribes, all the way from the Senecas of New York to the Modocs of California, of course, Southeast tribes, Southwest tribes, uh, the Great Lakes area. So it's very diverse. And 
uh, in working with all the tribes, as our organization does, it's the, the diversity is almost beyond imagination of how unique uh, each of them are. And yet, because of the length of time that Oklahoma Territory was only founded in 1890, but it was Indian land much longer uh, than that, back to the 1830s, the, uh, but at the same time, the acculturation process that even across all of our natives people, as diverse as they are, even within tribal families, even within groups, you see incredible diversity even there because some of them embrace Christianity to the ultimate degree. Other places and parts of the state in segments still speak their native language primarily and, and practice uh, you know, more traditional practices of spirituality and connection. So it is very diverse. It's not only a diverse state with 39 tribes, but among those, there's incredible diversity among its families, individuals, and people. Great. So you mentioned one thing about land and certainly ancestral homelands are vastly different than what tribes have today, what we think of as reservation lands. You know, the indigenous peoples in North America have survived so many traumas from disease and war to loss of ancestral homelands, forced boarding school attendance that broke families apart, and attempts to force people to give up their language and cultural practices. Even today, they, there is still a fight for promised resource rights and resource protections. So how does that impact? And maybe this is a good place, Art, to talk about a little redress here. What has happened in this past week with just the American Psychological Association alone in dealing with issues of racism and how do we even start? We can never make up for those traumas, but how do we start to honor and respect and acknowledge them? Right. So it's been a long journey for sure and lots of stories to tell, but uh, indigenous psychologists and uh, other indigenous or uh, psychologists of color have worked very hard to sort of push the American Psychological Association to be more inclusive and to own up, you know, through truth and reconciliation processes as to what the history has been um, and how people have been harmed. Um, and so on Friday, history was made within the American Psychological Association. Uh, three different resolutions were passed unanimously. Um, and um, so the first was an apology from the American Psychological Association to all the people of color who have been harmed, including indigenous Americans, um, by the racism inherent in the organization itself and by systemic racism in the society more broadly. Attached to that particular resolution was an anti-racist resolution that promises that the association will be involved with efforts to, um, you know, retire racism um, in the U.S. and um, of course, how it impacts our sovereign nations um, and uh, the third resolution that was passed was the health equity resolution that promises that the American Psychological Association will be uh, promoting health equity as uh, a priority within the association. And the, all of these um, uh, resolutions will certainly, if carried forward, and you know, I say that because we have a long history of things being promised and not delivered, but if carried forward, there's a, a great promise of uh, probably improving health and mental health as a result of these activities. And um, certainly I think we can count the American Psychological Association as a potential ally moving forward to um, advancing the health and mental health of our collective people. Annie Wiley, do you want to? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, Oki Nixoko X, Nisto Natanako Amanisiaki. So, um, so hello, friends. <laughs> My name is Annie Belcourt, our Otter Woman, and I'm I'm honored to be here and humbled to be here um, to help represent, as has been kind of spoken to, 
you know, the, the, the vast diversity that is, you know, something that is oftentimes referred to as Indian country or Native American communities. And, you know, and I, I teach classes and I, I work um, in research uh, and I've also worked clinically with folks across the years. Um, and, you know, the thing that I am struck by um, is, is the resiliency within American Indian communities, the strengths that are kind of um, present and I appreciate the APA's, you know, you know, apology essentially that has been offered and and, and um, commitment to working towards uh, deconstructing racism and discrimination that has systematically uh, placed American Indians at higher risk, not only for for mental health issues that are very apparent and the focus of our conversation, but also as we are continuing to go through this pandemic, health disparities that are very very. Um, evident within here, my homelands in, in Montana, um, where we have American Indians who are suffering more um, due to this. And, and part of that um, human suffering is, is a lack of access to care that happens here in Montana and throughout the country as well. And, and that extends to, um, to all um, members of our indigenous communities. So I appreciate the fact that we're kind of talking about how we can move forward in ways that are um, adaptive and, and positive and, you know, incorporating, you know, maybe fields that are beyond mental health professionals and looking at how do we kind of cross cut, you know, cultural um, barriers that may be, exist within our country that have systematically um, placed American Indians at a disadvantage um, in terms of health equity. So, I, yeah, I, I thank you for, for bringing these topics up because it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of interest and a lot of continued sustained um, development towards improving uh, mental health for American Indian peoples. Great. Thank you. So you started to touch on some of that access to care. What are some of the key barriers for tribal communities, whether they be economic barriers or lack of programs and providers that are sensitive to native and indigenous culture? What are some of the things that are the strongest barriers for Native communities accessing care? I, I mean, personally, here in Montana, we're a very rural state, and we have a very, um, very um, systematic barrier to accessing mental health care, period. Um, there, we have one of the highest suicide rates in the country, and we've had that, you know, for years. And part of the reason is, um, you know, well, American Indians, I should say, represent a, a lot of um, disproportionate numbers of suicide. And that's one extreme example, but it's an example of a system that is in many ways broken. And, and I, I say that, you know, not to denigrate mental health field or anything, but we have not made the proper investments in health here in Montana and elsewhere to help to provide um, access points. So, you know, when we think about having access to providers of, um, of color or American Indian counselors or providers, you know, we really haven't been able to do that. We have only a handful of psychologists in our entire state um, who are American Indian. And um, there are programs that are looking to kind of um, increase representation. But the reality is, is that we, we have to become more creative. And in, in, in part, maybe that's working with our educational systems to help provide people have, um, you know, basic skills in mental health and basic skills in reflective listening and referring and, you know, many different factors that we can help to reduce some of the barriers that face people who are seeking help. Um, and that could be help for substances or other mental health um, issues. And part of that is one of the things I, I want to definitely mention is the work that's being done on a residential school or boarding schools. And so when we think about the cause of health disparities and mental health, we, we have to kind of acknowledge the fact that for many you know years, American Indians were not allowed to raise our own children and had our children forcibly removed. And when that happens, that really, as a psychologist, I can appreciate the ways that that impacts not only individuals, but communities. And I think we have to invest in communities in ways that can systematically uplift communities and help development and help mental health in ways that, that help everyone. Um, and that's gonna take some work. At, you know, that, that's, that's where things are at here in Montana. 
So how do you even begin to work toward rebuilding, if even rebuilding is the right word, building maybe initially some trust with systems that have been broken so long and that Native American communities have basically had a strong mistrust of government services and, and care from white practitioners. How do we begin to heal that and, and make it make it less scary, um, for lack of a better term, for people to even seek assistance? Yeah, I think that one of the things that has to happen is that um, that allies need to be present and demonstrate that they're trustworthy. Um, and so that means they need to be visible um, in the community um, and they need to participate in a way that's culturally appropriate for that community. Um, and, you know, request permission of the sovereign government to actually interact within those communities. Um, so I think it's, it's a demonstration of uh, a commitment to trust, but also a commitment to sustainability in terms of the relationships. Uh, that's uh, been a serious problem in, in many uh, indigenous communities is that people will, um, you know, have a relationship with the community and commit to a very time limited association often re related to grant funding and that sort of thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, grant funding dries up and uh, researchers often move on. Um, and that's not our way. You know, our way is that you, if you're committed, you're committed um, for good um, and that you're going to um, have the collective heart of the people centered into your life, um, including your professional relationship with our people. In Oklahoma, the <clears throat> advent for 15 years now, the casino industry has given some of our tribes an incredible ability to build health clinics and mental health centers that are absolutely state of the art. And if you live near one of those, you're very, very fortunate in that you have incredible care. I've done training in almost all of those facilities for uh, the counseling staff as well as at the university. But then we have other parts of the state, particularly in the western side of the state, where the care is much more sparse, probably very similar to the other rural areas. And yet even with greater access of care than we've ever had for the Native community, our teen suicide rate is still the highest of any ethnic group in the state, even with care and help available. So, you know, bridging those gaps, it, it takes that interconnection of the tribe and <clears throat> the training at the school levels even, you know, is to reach out to the community programs through all the public schools even for programs that are available and uh, education of, of, of what is really available. And, and the sense of trauma is just so inherent that you know, the, the family system, because of the Boarding School Act and all the other things that have happened, you still see the effects long, long after the fact of multiple generation of not having, you know, the nurturance or, or the parenting or two parents in the home or, you know, time and money to take care. And we still see the trickle down effect. So having the facilities is great, but it's even beyond that to the, the uh, individuals and the healing that needs to happen within uh, individual lives uh, on and on and generation after generation. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the issues is that, um, you know, people continue to um, practice mental health as a sort of a psychological or counseling bandaging rather than addressing the core issues behind um, you know, what's happening within our communities. You know, we have suicide problems here um, and had for decades. I mean, these are disparities that have been with us intergenerationally. Um, and opioid addiction is a serious problem here as well. Um, and, you know, uh, the way I look at it is a very holistic way, which is the, the way we think about things. 
in that, you know, as long as we're only addressing the symptoms of what's happening to our people and not getting to the core of what the problems are, uh, I think we will continue to have um, very little progress in terms of, of how we move forward. Even though we, we work so hard, it's like we're, you know, treading water sometimes. So, you know, what I'm thinking of is um, in a health equity model, you have to think about the relationship of, of health equity with economic equity and um, also with educational equity. Um, and so I think, you know, just very broadly speaking, we have to address some major systemic issues that are the sources of, of the harm to our people. Um, and until we fully address those things, I think we will continue to have surges and uh, difficulties within our community. Yeah, I would completely agree with, uh, you know, those statements. I think, you know, that this is, um, is a problem, like you mentioned, so the question was around trust and how to rebuild trust. One of the ways you do that is, is to hold um, individuals and institutions accountable. And accountability is something that, you know, hasn't always happened for American Indian people. Um, unfortunately, you know, we've seen, um, you know, you know, pockets of, of interest and in research, or we've seen other things. Sometimes those have been extractive, frankly, and they haven't actually helped the community in ways that are applied and that provide data and advocacy for American Indian communities. And I think those are some things that we can do that are action oriented. And that's what's really required is that we all work to help, you know, create level playing fields. And part of that is also acknowledging our history and holding people accountable. But on, a, on the flip side, another thing to kind of um, think about is also just like, I mentioned creativity and I mentioned that because I find a ton of hope in a lot of our youth who are really engaged in activism, in storytelling, in creating art that is, um, you know, defiant um, towards these systematic injustices that American Indian people have faced. And I think that's really cool. I think that the fact that we are having more representation in media and storytelling and um, nationally in the news and even like um, like in fashion, <laughs> an example I just saw, like you know that that we have um, we have Native people who are actually being seen and heard for one of the first times in my life, um, and you know this is an intergenerational issue of trauma, but it's also one of hope, and and I'm very fortunate that I came from a family where my my father was a um, public health advocate and he worked with tribes throughout Montana and Wyoming, and he led by example by doing that. And for me, that was a really, you know, big inspiration to become a psychologist and to become a researcher who's indigenous and to work on some of these issues around empowerment and empowerment science is something that I'm passionate about. How do we kind of create ways that science can serve communities in ways that is action oriented and not simply extractive? So those are one thing. And then my daughter has become a filmmaker and, and you know, um, she's, you know, putting you know, public health into action through her film and creating voices for women who oftentimes within our communities are further marginalized and, and experience violence in ways that are disproportionate. And we see the missing and murdered indigenous women movement being in the headlines. But what we really also need to look at is their stories and how do we empower American Indian women to respond in ways that can save their lives. And I think we just came out of um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And one of the things that we know is that American Indians have higher rates of domestic violence. There are things that we can do to help prevent that and to help survivors get help if they need. That's one example. You know, you know, every example that we talk about, suicide, mental health, all of these things have a systemic cause. And so we have to have a systemic solution towards that. And part of that is, is definitely, as you're describing, education, law enforcement, housing, mental health, all of these different fa factors that feed into disparities that we see today. But there's a ton of hope out there too. You know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing stories that haven't been told in ways that we haven't seen them. And I think that there are a lot of things that we all could do individually and collectively to help invest in those voices. 
So we have a question from Tana, who is actually our assistant director at the Evergreen Council. Do you know of any programs or services that seem to be making headway in addressing the root problems behind the high teen suicide rates? If not, what do you think is needed? This is certainly, we see it here in Washington. You've mentioned it in Montana. Wiley, you mentioned it in Oklahoma. Um, I think this is a systemic issue across the country um, for all teens, but even higher rates for Native American teens. So any thoughts on Tana's question? Well, our organization has begun doing, as, as part of our outreach efforts, uh, assist applied suicide intervention skills training. And we have done it at Indian uh, Riverside uh, Indian School in Anadarko to their staff by their invitation, actually, for us to come in and help in the community of Anadarko and lot in some of our Western communities. And it's something we hope to do to spread to more and more school systems or areas of our state that are heavily Native populated. Uh, for teachers, just about anyone can go through this. It's not like a Columbia training where you really need to be a more of a psychologist kind of person or a counselor, but almost anyone can become aware of this. So that's one of our efforts is to branch out and do the uh, assist training any place that we can get in the door is just a part of our outreach. And you know, we're a gambling uh, center by, by name. Uh, gambling clients have the highest rate of suicide attempts of any of the addictions. So it's, it's just a part of it. Plus we're very sensitive to the native issues that need this help as well. Yeah, I, I know that there's there's a ton of efforts and a lot of people who are really passionate about suicide um, prevention and doing work to help our communities. Uh, so it's hard to kind of list one or two, you know, but, um, but I, I do know that there have been some really great efforts also to provide training throughout our schools. Um, uh, Dr. Megan Rides at the Door is a person who works from the Native Child Trauma Center here on our campus. Um, our campus, we do, um, we have um, a number of different programmings where we're trying to con you know, improve our outreach and our prevention abilities within different communities in Montana. Uh, one of the things I've saw seen that was like a community developed and homegrown effort, which I think is really cool, is called the Warrior Movement. And there's videos out there that are around prevention and that that developed by you know, youth on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribal Reservation and and they, they created all of this outreach and this public health prevention videos, telling their story and, and getting trainings out. And I just think that that's really, you know, innovative and cool. And I what I've observed, it seems to be helping. And, and that's like the bottom line. I think that, you know, um, we all want, you know, our stories to be heard in ways that can help you know, help others and help others heal. Um, we have also in Montana, our, our um, we have a whole division that at the state level that's devoted towards suicide prevention. And Donnie Wetzel has done some work on that area as well, where he's doing skill teaching and different efforts that are um, based on these things. But some of it is, is frankly, um, you know, helping engage youth who are most at risk sometimes um, and helping each other and empowering them to do some of that work because, um, and, and not in a way that's like obviously not wanting to put too much burden on them, but but like telling their stories. We do digital storytelling workshops. We do, um, you know, I started a podcast. Getting people to kind of use their voices around their experiences can help others and in ways that sometimes we we can't as as a clinical therapist and in the room that we have you know we see them once a week or a couple times a week so some of those community based efforts i think are really promising and and there are a ton throughout the country i know but um, those are a couple that kind of come to mind as as the question i, I couldn't agree with you more i think that what we've seen working with youth is a couple of things. I mean, you talk about wanting our stories heard, wanting our voices heard. And I think with youth in particular, having youth work with youth, giving youth a safe place to start sharing those stories because it's often very difficult for them to begin to share stories of their own trauma or their own issues at home or at school. 
So giving them that outlet and then giving them that outlet through particularly all of those creative endeavors. Youth are amazing with creative opportunities to share their voice, whether it's film, whether it's digital, whether it's music has been a very powerful um, tool for us, poetry, dance. So to me, it kind of takes all of those wonderful traditions that are already a part of native culture, the, the talking circles, the songs and drumming, the storytelling, um, and brings them into the modern day in a way that's really quite beautiful, almost a reawakening of traditions with kind of a new, a new face. Um, so we find that very exciting with the youth here in our state. And I, I'm sorry, Art, I think you were about to say something too. So let me. Well, there's so much to say and, and that's what's beautiful about it. Things are, are looking up in a variety of ways. I just wanted to point to a couple of programs that I'm aware of that um, really work on prevention of suicide from early age on. Um, so the People Awakening Project in Alaska has had pretty good results in terms of using traditional practice, their traditional practices to um, instill strong ethnic identity in their youth um, with good outcomes. Here in Washington State, uh, the journey of the circles um, followed by the journey of the canoe have been really um, quite powerfully um, preventive in terms of not only uh, suicidal behaviors, but also um, you know, onset of drinking and using uh, by youth. Um, so those are uh, potentials that people can look to. I mean, psychological research suggests that a program that promotes strong ethnic identity combined with a preparation for bias uh, can be particularly powerful for preparing uh, youth for the inevitable um, challenges of uh, meeting other groups of people um, and experiencing biases within those encounters. I think that's crucial. And I think that when we look at research, again, we have difficulties right there because most of the research we have and most of the evidence-based practices we have are based not on a broader range of cultural diversity but really focus on the majority. And that, that goes against what you just said. So we need to work more closely in our research and our evidence-based tools. And how do we incorporate, and for Native American communities, how do we incorporate those culturally-based practices, whether it's sweat lodges or smudging or the storytelling or dancing how do we incorporate that into our treatment practices together with complementing CBT and all of the evidence-based motivational interviewing that we know work, but aren't enough to heal the whole? Are you doing that in your practice now, Wiley or, or Annie? Well, I wanted to give a couple examples. So one of the things I think it's also important to recognize, like here in Montana, most of our native folks live on reservations, but it's not like that across the country. Mm -hmm. Most native people live in, in urban areas. And so one of the projects that came to mind as you were talking was um, um, Dan Dickerson's work out of UCLA, who's doing um, a drum assisted uh, therapy for substance abuse prevention in youth. And he's actually working with urban American Indians and and I think that he's having some really promising results coming out of that and looking at, um, you know, building identity and all the things that we're kind of describing as positive factors for um, communities of color as well as American Indian um, youth. And, and that that's, I think, really promising. Uh, one of the things I personally have worked some with is um, a, a process called uh, narrative exposure therapy for trauma, which is a trauma therapy that is based on storytelling. And colleagues of mine at the University of Washington have, have done some clinical trial work on that therapy, comparing it to other forms of therapy that are cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, so we've been able to um, pilot that here in Montana. And I know that there've been larger projects in Washington that have done the same thing. And, and it is, um, 
a therapy, I provided a link to some discussion more about the actual therapy and what kind of goes into it. But basically, it's helping people tell their stories and, and doing so in a way that it helps them to to do basic components of exposure and response prevention. So you you help them walk through you know, traumatic events and you help them process it in, in ways that are more adaptive and, and helpful for their long-term healing. So that's the kind of heart of it. But the cool thing about it is it corresponds to a lot of our traditions as storytellers, as native people. And that it also doesn't require somebody to have like a really advanced degree. It's really designed for people who are more, um, natural helpers. And so people who are, you know, good at helping and listening to other people. And um, so those are some examples of things I think that are, are trying to incorporate traditional uh, approaches. I have um, one of my um, colleagues here in Missoula is looking at studying that as well and knowledge and attitudes and beliefs and looking at um, substance abuse and use patterns for American Indian people and wanting to develop an intervention as well. So I think that's where a lot of the kind of cutting edge and his name is Deshane Barnett and he has, is our actual Missoula County Health Officer as well. Um, and uh, so he's, his plate is pretty full, but he is doing some really cool work to look at how do we understand this from the science and then how do we think about applying it for practice? which is, I think, a lot of where we're all sort of trying to work towards is, is have our science informed practice in effective ways. Yeah, I agree. And uh, just one to tag along with uh, talking about narrative therapy. We um, use narrative therapy in our indigenous relapse prevention uh, treatment manual um, for our work uh, with Monica Skewis, and, and that work's actually being done in Montana, um, but in a different part of Montana. Um, so um, yeah, it, I think that is one of the keys, and Annie's really raised an important point is, you know, um, you know how can we take the things that, um, you know, seem to work for others but make them more culturally appropriate for our own people. And narrative therapy, like Annie said, is, is um, so aligned with our particular cultural perspectives and storytelling. Yeah. I mean, we used it not only to address substance use, but and you know, prevent relapse, but also to address um, you know, intergenerational trauma and, and um, acts of experiencing racism. Mm -hmm. And the diversity of our native communities in Oklahoma is um, you, you, you just can't make an assumption that they would participate in any of the activities you mentioned earlier. You know, they may be very, very church oriented or other uh, emphasis. So it, what I try to encourage our counselors to do is ask, get the person to tell you what the culture means to them and what what builds connection to them? And if it's nothing, then, then you can help with that to find some alternatives that could do that. But without that sense of connection, the brain really has no way to uh, you know, find new pathways. Without that ultimate sense of being connected with, we will repeat the same patterns over and over again, which brings up our narrative. You know, if we can understand our story, where we've come from, how we've done things, do we really have options? Or are we living our life like a train? Trains don't have steering wheels. They follow the tracks we laid down of our negative narratives or the, that side of our brain that collects all the negativity in the, uh, on each side. And so it can be very helpful, but um, I, I'm always amazed at how even counselors that are very experienced we have to encourage them to not make any assumptions and to let the individual teach us what culture or their ethnic group or whatever it might be, even their sexual preferences, what that means to this individual. And if you're threatened by that or uncomfortable with that, you need to get some help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, need, you need to say, why does that make me uncomfortable? What, what's, what is it about this that you know makes me not able to do my job, which is to be that connective conduit to, to everyone that walks in the door. Um, I say one other thing about barriers to care is um, there are not enough native counselors to go around at all of our centers. So they're occupied by many people 
of <clears throat> different colors and particularly white in our state. And uh, that's a barrier to care because you'll just find some traditional people that just do not want to do that. So building trust has to be individual to individual of uh, being respectful and letting that person teach us uh, what culture means to them. Yeah. Agreed completely and understanding our own biases before we even sit down. Um, I think we all have so much work to do to better understand history. I, I think many people do not truly understand the history of native indigenous peoples in the Americas. And you know, people tend to think of it in relation to the Dawes Act and government processes, but we're talking about cultures that were here for thousands of years before any Europeans, before any Russians, before anyone else came to these lands. So we have to think much farther back. We have to open up our minds and understand the cultures better in order to ever be able to serve anyone properly. And if we can't, then we need to seek additional training or additional education for ourselves as well. And it kind of goes back to the very beginning where we were talking about sovereign nations. How do you help your students, your clinicians, your clients understand sovereignty when it comes to sovereign tribal nations? Because I find that there is an incredible amount of misunderstanding just with that term, when I talk to people who, who are predominantly Caucasian, how would you explain sovereignty to them? Because it impacts everything we do with native communities. I mean, I personally, um, I try to do some of that with, with, with my own actions by, I volunteer for the Blackfeet Nation IRB as a reviewer. And part of that is educating people who are interested in research especially with our community about sovereignty and about also the need for um, research to benefit the community. And so those are kind of primary sort of requirements that we look for when we do um, IRB reviews. And of course, the Belmont principles and all the other ethical aspects. But the thing is that we want to make sure that people are held accountable for work that's done within communities. And, and part of as a campus, we also provide um, education to our faculty, our new faculty about native history. And it's very basic, I will say, um, but it's it's very necessary. I mean, I am always shocked by, um, of course, there's a lot of goodwill that faculty come in with and who wanna teach, you know, university or high school or anywhere, um, but, oftentimes there's just a shocking lack of knowledge around American Indian history. And, and the fact that, you know, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't vote <laughs> until 1920. We couldn't practice our own religion until 1978. And and most people don't know these things. I mean, we take it for granted. There was just a textbook that came out that talked about, are we over-exaggerating the genocide that happened to American Indian people that was distributed and published and, and this was just this week. So, so when we think about the need to educate communities, I mean, we have a lot of work to do and we have a lot of work to do, not only for American Indian people, for, but like, as you said, for LGBTQ plus communities, for our other, um, you know, people of color in our, in our country. Every year I teach multicultural public health and, and I, you know, I start that from the premise of, of exactly that. There are a ton of different sources of diversity and none of us can be experts on any of them. So the cultural humility piece is really helpful as we think about sort of being humble in our own experiences and how we see the world and how that influences our work as a professional as well. So so those are those are a few different things. But yeah, we 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 have a ton of work to do. Um, and we should not put it on our Indian students as well. Um, that's one of the things I see commonly happen. And it's really um, a barrier for some of our students who are most at risk because they don't have usually a, a lot of accumulated wealth um, and wealth being financial as well as sort of experience base around education and an opportunity to like advance training and things of that nature. So people want to get these degrees, Native people want to excel in different areas, but 
most frequently we're not allowed to historically. And the more that we allow people to be aware and be responsible for their own education around that, I think is, is a service to others. In Oklahoma, sovereignty is never a given. It's fought for every day. And, it, you know, you, you, you get an inch and, and lose two. And so even with our compacts on, on gaming or gambling, it's, um, you know, yes, we're going to allow you to have this and make money, but now we don't like you because you're making too much money and we're going to pull things back. So in every expression of sovereignty, it's, it isn't a given. It's, it has to be fought for. And our large tribes now have their own legal teams of educated, you know, of that nation lawyers. And so things are changing. But when you have to fight your own state government tooth and nail uh, around any issue that comes up of equity, uh, they end up doing it themselves as much as they can and then have to fight for every inch that they get. So it is not a commonly accepted term of a right you know, or equal government negotiations and those things, it has to be fought for every step of the way. And I'm so appreciative of our nations that invest the time and the money to do this because it's the only way things will systemically change. And that's a big statement saying systemically, but make little headways along the way. So why so do we bring up, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, um, we got a bit, a little bit of an echo here. Wiley, you bring up something really important um, when it, we start to talk about gaming and gambling. And I think, again, there are a lot of misunderstandings of where tribal gaming originated, how it has grown, what are the rights there, and what are the differences between traditional gaming and gambling within tribal culture. And we might have stick games or bone games or dice games that we're for a very different purpose than what today's kind of commercial gambling is all about. So when we talk about gambling and gaming and tribal casinos and responsible gambling and gambling disorder, what are the important messages that we need to have out there again so that the, the stigma is shot down, so that the barriers to access to treatment are shot down so that people can get the help they need and not feel this constant stigma, as you said, we, you, you made money, now we're unhappy that you're making money. Well, that you, you don't, can't have it both ways. Yeah. You know? So how do you deal with that in Oklahoma? Well, it's, it's, it's encouraging our tribes and most of them are willing to have the conversation that if you have this, there are gonna be people that develop a problem uh, called gambling disorder. Now, what do we do? And if you have this, you're going to have native people develop a problem. Have the conversation, first of all. And it, the attitude among native people, it certainly varies everywhere, but that this is just what we do. We've always gambled. Well, there may be an element of truth to that in that, you know, if you look at studies that have been done or archaeological digs even, there's evidence of gambling or gaming type activities that go that, that precede certainly Western invasion. So it's been here for a long time. No one knows in history when gaming, like the bone game in the Northwest, which is the hand game among our Cheyenne, Arapaho, Cowitz, the Moxican game in the Southwest. All these are very similar games or stickball being played for money in the Southeast part of the country. All of these were games that were played at annual events or gatherings or you know whatever in a traditional fashion. When did it become gambling in history? Well, nobody really knows, but it certainly preceded Western invasion into this country. And it's very interesting that the class one type games, which is all of the native games that were here and that have been played for, for many, many years, uh, you know, can't be touched by the government. And then class two gaming, which is the bingo, electronic bingo, and all the court cases that settled that. But today you have class three uh, gambling, which looks no different in any native casino than it does in Las Vegas or New Jersey. They're the same buildings, they're the same machines, and now it's become universal. You know, you have the same, you know, aristocrat gaming in Australia makes probably 40% of the games in our state, you know, as well as macaw. 
uh, you know, China. So it's everywhere that this has become universal. So the regional or ethnic forms of gaming have, uh, they're still there, but they have been certainly embraced and surrounded by the universal games such as, you know, Texas Hold'em, which wasn't even in the original World Series of Poker games. You know, it's less than 30 years old as a trend and now class three gaming. So it's very different and games of class one type athletic competitions or the odds would have been quite limited. Now we have random number generators where you can't even figure odds because the outcome is purely random and, you know, figured in an entirely different complex way. So it's entirely different in the forms of gambling we have today versus, versus before. But the history is also very fascinating. Like if you look at the uh, Hopi story of the destruction of the little village called Pinyanap Hopi, if you look at the description of the obsession about playing this game called Total Lospi, and this story is over a thousand years old, you can see the DSM-5 criteria of the gambling disorder in how the people lose themselves in the activity. They lose track of time and space. They're not attending rituals anymore. All they want to do is go to the Kiva and, and play Total Lospi. So the ritual field and the gambling field often intersected. But gambling has always had, through Native culture and Western culture, that, that divination side to it of wanting to know the outcome of the uncertainty. And so it still exists today in the same fashion. So it's interesting how West and Native cultures have met and converged into this you know, mixture of where we are today, all centered around chance and probability and so forth, uh, but wanting to know the mystery. Wanting to know the mystery. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say that in Washington, and I think it's true in, in other states as well, tribal nations, particularly the, the tribal gaming um, in our state, have really taken the lead in many respects to the responsible gambling side. And I think it ties back to that sense of connectedness and balance and community and overall health is that yes, we offer these games for recreation and entertainment, but if you do have a problem, we want you to have resources, whether they're self-exclusion programs, whether they're behavioral health and wellness programs, whether they're prevention programs. The tribes have really been major leaders um, to make those programs and resources available to people. And I think that that needs to be acknowledged and we need to be thankful for that, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I certainly couldn't operate as an organization without their contributions to us. In fact, we were founded by donations from the five large tribes of our state and still exist for the same reason. So they've seen the need from the very beginning and they continue to be our largest participants and those that carry the message for responsible gambling to the public. Yeah, definitely. I, I just want to add, like, um, I think I think those are all important and true statements. And I think moderation is something that we think about with regard to harm reduction, which is always a good, you know, strategy for some of these factors, especially it's complicated, like you say, because it is part of our history and cultural practices. However, not the same way, right? Same thing with like commercial tobacco use. And we have yeah. those things. Like for me, I think about it in, in the context of um, trauma-informed care. So when I think about um, things like like hypervigilance, anxiety, and, and how that feeds into avoidance behaviors and some of those kind of cycles that people, one of the things that I know that that is helpful towards is to have compassion for people who are struggling with addiction and, and to have um, them have hope towards recovery, um, the same as we do for other substance abuse um, disorders, which are oftentimes based on trying to have people regulate their emotions in a very maladaptive way sometimes. So if they overdo, you know, substances or gambling and those sorts of things. So, you know, I come back to that as thinking about a way to move forward is like that, you know, harm reduction model, which, you know, is, is kind of acknowledging that this has got a complex history within our communities, but also, you know, ways to, to help to kind of mitigate some of the damage that could be associated with some of these yeah. behaviors. You know, I think one of the tools of re building resiliency, there was a study done by a colleague from Baylor uh, with the Malawi grandmothers listing 
what builds resiliency and, and a very complex situation. But two that they added that's not in the normal list that I see was um, compassion. You know, and I think, you know, that real expression of genuine loving kindness and compassion for people that have these issues because they are medicating themselves from the trauma of their lives. This gambling episode or this drug or this behavior temporarily relieves, you know, the symptoms of the PTSD. It's, it's temporary, but it works every time. If you can get enough money to go do it long enough, you get some relief. And the, the incredible compassion, but, but it's the systemic compassion of what caused the problems in the first place that needs to be enhanced as well. Not and just that compassion in both ways, I think, would do more to eliminate stigma than anything else we can possibly do. And stigma is still the largest barrier to anyone accessing care to these public health and mental health issues. I want to very quickly um, ask each of you, and I want to start with Annie because I know she's got another appointment she needs to go to. In this National American Indian Heritage Month and in this time of looking at mental health equity, what are one or two things you would most want to leave our audience with to just think about and open up their minds to in the days, months, and years ahead as we continue to work on these issues? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think um, the primary thing is, is, to, is to foster um, a sense of curiosity and you know, generosity of spirit towards other people and, and to think about this, the other stories that people may have within them that, that are around ways that we can generate compassion and hope for each other. And part of that is like learning, you know, and being open to learning and being open to saying, you know, I made a mistake or I was wrong when I thought this, or, you know, I can learn from these behaviors and I can kind of move forward in a better way. But I think there's a ton of hope within that. And there's a lot of inspiration within our ability to, to be generational sort of cycle stoppers and, and, and to like disrupt the, the impact historical trauma has had upon our lives and, and prevent that from, from moving any, any further and, and helping our children and, and future generations as well. So but thank you and I apologize, I do have to leave. <laughs> no, thank you so much for joining us. Just amazing information. Um, we will see you again, I hope very soon, Annie. Art, how about you? What are what are one or two things you might want people to mull over? Yeah, so, you know, indigenous people begin with very different um, assumptions about worldview. Um, some of those around um, egalitarian relationships and interdependence within the natural order. Um, and we also assume sacredness of the natural order, which is very different than uh, what we see happening out in uh, mainstream America, I think. So I would just challenge people to, to consider how different um, mental health practices, services, um, and the people who need those, how different it would be if we were to assume that all of us were sacred individuals. Um, and worthy of respect. Mm. Mm. Wiley? The only thing I would uh, add, which isn't adding anything, because Annie already spoke of it, was to encourage creativity and to um, express and tell the story uh, on, uh, and, and, and through compassionate, compassionate connection, allow that creativity to, to birth and, and to express itself. I think it is a key tool to building resiliency is to help find creativity. And I would just add that I think we need to be open to how much we can learn from other diverse communities and Native Americans are certainly among those. When we look at holistic health, whether at prevention and awareness or treatment and recovery, we have to meet individuals and communities where they are with respect. And we have to recognize that some paths have been well-traveled and feel familiar to people. And some paths are new and some paths have yet to be explored as we talked about many of those great new opportunities with youth. But if we explore them carefully and respectfully, we can learn from native people along the paths that they have forged for centuries. 
And I think there is so much rich wisdom to be learned there that I am just honored to have had all of you with us to share your thoughts and your wisdom today. I hope people will continue to learn from you by going to our blogs, going to our website where you all have shared many, many resources that are valuable. And I hope we will see you soon and best to you in this very exciting time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me.